Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Taipei and to tell you about this work on, on Tensor Network Decoding. So uh, before I start, let's maybe briefly recap what the decoding problem is in quantum error correction very briefly. So let's fix some quantum code. Let's say we have a code word in our code and that code word undergoes some sort of noise. In order to recover the quantum information, what we typically do, we do some sort of syndrome measurement on that noisy code word, which gives us a syndrome bit string, which we pass as input to some classical algorithm, which we call the decoder. And that classical algorithm tries to figure out what sort of correction operation we should apply in order to hopefully get back to our original code word. So th today I'm gonna focus on that classical decoding algorithm. And I'm gonna show how you can use tensor networks to do this. And very broadly speaking, when we evaluate a decoding algorithm, we usually do it according to two criteria, you could say. One of them is speed and the other is accuracy. So tensor network decoders are decoders which are typically very accurate, but they're often more on the slower side. So especially the decoders I'm gonna show you today, they're probably too slow to be realizable in real-time error correction, but still having these slow but accurate decoders can be very interesting for multiple reasons. They might allow you just to study codes, get a feeling what sort of like logical error rates you can possibly achieve. And uh, also importantly for, for near-term error correction experiments when you actually don't do any sort of um, logical non-Clifford gates, um, so essentially do quantum memory experiments, oftentimes you can do the decoding purely offline. That means in post-processing. So you don't really care that much about the speed of the decoder here. So very broadly speaking, uh, the general procedure of a tensor network decoder goes like this. You have the input of the decoder is the syndrome bit string. So um, you generate some sort of tensor network from that syndrome bit string. You contract the tensor network. And given that contraction results, uh, you decide on a correction operation. And uh, step one and three are, from a computational point of view, are, are quite trivial. And the real meat of the decoder lies in that tensor network contraction. And uh, in fact, if you do this contraction exactly without any, uh, any sort of like numerical approximation, typically the tensor network decoder is laid out to kind of give you the optimal decoder. That means the decoder that finds the correct correction operation with the highest physically possible probability. Uh, unfortunately, the contraction complexity typically scales exponentially with the code size, which means that we have to use some sort of approximate contraction algorithms to actually make this into a workable decoder. And, uh, but this is the only heuristic in the decoder. In a certain sense, compared to other decoding algorithms, like maybe matching or belief propagation, it's a heuristic you can control much more because you can at least in principle make the approximation error as small as you want. So one more comment, the tensor network that we're gonna observe uh, using our decoder is gonna follow the locality of the underlying code, right? So if you start with a 2D local code, like a 2D surface code, the resulting tensor network is gonna be some 2D local tensor network. And similarly, if you have like a 3D surface code, you will end up with a 3D kind of tensor network. So wh why am I stressing this difference between 2D and 3D here? Let me say something about previous work on uh, tensor network decoders. So they've been around for a while, I think. Um, it's a paper by Poulin and Ferris in 2013 that first talks about the idea, and then Sergey Bravi in 2014 introduces the tensor network decoder for the 2D surface code. Uh, subsequent works have generalized the kind of idea for arbitrary 2D local codes. And essentially what these works observed is that if you kind of take the standard approach for approximately contracting these 2D tensor networks, it works amazingly well just out of the box. You essentially get the optimal decoder. So here I have a, a table which I took from Chris Chop's work, and he shows like various thresholds for like various surface codes and color codes with different kind of uh, noise models. And almost everywhere he gets like very, very close to the optimal thresholds using his tensor network decoder. So the 2D case is really a success story. Uh, why has there been very little work uh, that focuses on 3D codes yet? Well, the reason is that the approximate contraction of three-dimensional tensor networks is in practice something that is much harder to get to get well and it's still a much more active uh, topic of, of research. So if, if 3D is harder to deal with, why, why should we bother? Why should we go through these extra hoops? So, well, first of all, you might just be interested in, in studying three-dimensional codes, obviously, and maybe much more importantly, uh, in, even though we use, many people use 2D codes in practice on, in, in, in experiments, when you actually do experiments in reality, the, the syndrome extraction circuits themselves are, are noisy, right? So you can't trust the syndromes that you get 
out of your experiment. So the way how people often deal with that when they have two decodes is they repeat the syndrome extraction circuits many, many times. And the resulting decoding problem that you get is not a 2D problem anymore, it's a 2 plus 1D problem. So you get a, some sort of 3D tensor network. So I told you earlier that these slow but accurate decoders are very interesting for near-term quantum memory experiments. But if you want to apply the tensor network decoding in that setting, we obviously first have to somehow figure out how to make it work in 3D. So that's kind of the pitch for, for why 3D tensor network decoders are interesting and, and hopefully useful. Uh, let me tell you some, uh, about some more technical details and, and advancements that we did uh, uh, in this talk. So I will first say a little bit about how the opt optimal decoding task can be framed as a tensor network contraction. I'm gonna say a bit more about the approximate tensor network contraction, both in 2D and 3D, and why the 3D case is, is harder. And at the end, I'm gonna say something about 2D codes with circle level noise, because that's kind of, the difficulty of that is like on a whole nother level. So let's start with the optimal decoding. So let's make some assumptions. We work in some stabilizer codes. We assume that we have Pauli noise. That means the error that happens in our state is sampled from some distribution on the n qubit uh, Pauli group. The kind of, uh, the approach that most decoders usually follow is they try to figure out what's the most likely error, right? So if we define some set E of errors of Pauli operators, which are kind of compatible with the syndrome that we observed, most decoders in one way or another, they typically try to essentially find the element of that set which has the largest probability and they use that for correction. Well, this gives you a working decoder, a pretty good decoder, it's actually not the optimal decoder because it doesn't take into account degeneracy. So degeneracy in quantum error correction says that we can have physically distinct errors which have the same effect on the code space or more concretely in our setting here, uh, two errors which only differ by a stabilizer are essentially for all intents and purposes equivalent for us. So instead what the optimal decoder has to do, it has to figure out what's the most likely error class. And when I say error class, I mean a class of errors which, which only differ up to a stabilizer. And the probability of a certain error class is essentially given by the sum of all the probabilities of the errors that live inside that error class. So in order to get to a tensor network, I need one additional step. I'm gonna need to assume that somehow my noise model factorizes into local terms, right? So here I've written the simplest case where I have like IID qubit noise, uh, but you don't have to assume that, you can, you just need some sort of like, you can also assume like some uh, localized uh, correlated noise, for instance, so, so the technical condition here is that uh, you can express your probability distribution as some sort of Markov random field. And the point is that uh, when you look at this error class probability, which we had on the previous slide, uh, this now essentially turns out to be, well, it's a, it's a sum of some product terms, and this is exactly the sort of expressions which you can write as a tensor network. So how does the tensor network decoding procedure work now? For every logical error class, we're gonna build a tensor network. Uh, we're gonna contract all these tensor networks and we pick the, the logical error class where the contraction value was the largest one and we use that for the correction. So to give a little bit more detail, we give kind of two mappings, how you can map the logical uh, error class probability to, the, to a tensor network. We call them kind of the generator picture and the detector picture. They're kind of dual to each other, so I, I've drawn them here for the 2D surface code. You might notice that they're kind of equivalent, uh, the, the same, except I kind of interchange two types of tensors, kind of the check tensors and the delta tensors. So that's why they're, in a certain sense, dual to each other. And essentially, they just correspond to do two different representations of the logical error class probability as a sum of products. So for the generator picture, um, we, we represent the elements of the error class as by picking a representative error and then multiplying it with a stabilizer and then summing over all stabilizers. That gives all the elements in the error class. Whereas for the detector picture instead, we sum over all Pauli operators and we use this indicator functions to kind of filter out all the, the Paulis which do not cause the observed syndrome and which are not in the corresponding logical error class. And these indicator functions then correspond to check nodes in, in, the, in the tensor network. So one small comment here, you might expect that this logical uh, check here might be very high weight because the logical operator itself is very high weight. Uh, in order to deal that, we, we, have, a, there, we have a slight trick. We, we don't contract the tensor network itself, but like a Hadamard transform of it, which allows us to kind of dissolve that high weight logical check. If you're interested about the details, I'd be ha happy to say a bit more about it offline. Uh, if you're familiar with the statistical mechanical picture by like Steve, or Chris Chubb, this mathematically corresponds to this generator picture. 
And um, yeah, one more thing, like just interestingly, we observe numerically that for the approximate contraction, in some instances, the detector picture seems to perform much better than the generator picture, which is kind of interesting. Okay, uh, now to move on, let me say a little bit about approximate tensor network contraction. And I'm gonna start uh, with the 2D case first. Um, so just for simplicity, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that we have a nice two-dimensional uh, kind of square lattice tensor network. In, in general, in practice, you will encounter more complicated tensor networks, but what I'm gonna show here can be generalized to arbitrary kind of planar tensor networks, 2D tensor networks. The idea is we kind of wanna sweep a line from left to right to contract that tensor network, or more put differently, you wanna contract one column after another to the leftmost column. So let's, let's start by doing that. Uh, contracting the first two columns together, right? So the effect, uh, if you do that, is that the bond dimension here on the first column is now going to increase, right? And if you iteratively repeat that, uh, the tensors on your leftmost columns are gonna grow and grow exponentially in size, and that's not gonna be uh, efficient, right? So in order to, here we have to use our numerical approximation and actually truncate these, these bonds to a smaller bond dimension. And then we can iteratively repeat this process. We contract the column, we truncate, we contract the column, and we truncate until we end up with a nice kind of 1D chain tensor network, which we can exactly contract efficiently. Right, that's kind of the gist of the idea in 2D. So let's try to generalize this to, to three dimensions, right? So again, we're gonna assume that we have a nice, simple kind of cubic uh, tensor network structure. And the idea here is, um, again, we're not gonna sweep a line from left to right, we're gonna sweep a plane from bottom to top, right? So we're gonna want to contract one layer at a time into the bottommost layer, and every time that happens, um, the bond dimension is going to increase, right? So let's contract the first layer here. You see here, the bond dimension on the bottommost layer increases, so we have to truncate it again, and then we just repeat this procedure uh, one layer after another. A uh, little comment here, we don't actually in practice in the numerics, we don't actually like contract one complete layer at a time, we kind of extrude two neighboring uh, tensors from a layer and kind of contract that two qubit gate at once and then do the truncation, but this picture still kind of gives you the gist of what's going on. So if you just repeat this again, at the end we end up with a nice 2D tensor network and then we can just use the technique from, from 2D to just contract that if, uh, efficiently. Okay, so I just showed you a picture how you can do the 2D and 3D contraction. It seems kind of similar. So why is 3D supposed to be harder now? Uh, it all has to do with the truncation uh, step in the contraction, right? So let's think about the intermediate state that we have in the truncation, uh, in the contraction. So in the 2D case, we have like a 1D chain of tensors like that, which you call a matrix product state, MPS. And in the 2D case, you'll have something that looks more like a PEPS network, right? So if you take now a, a, a bond, in that MPS and you want to truncate that, the way uh, there, there's a very, uh, it's, it's actually very clear how you want to do that optimally, right? You can think of that bond kind of separating your MPS into two distinct subsystems, and then the, the, the truncation can be framed as, as essentially wanting to find a low rank approximation of a certain matrix. And it's very well known how to do, do that. You essentially use a truncated singular value decomposition. And you can do that numerically very efficiently. Whereas if you try to play the same game on your PEPS network on the right, if you cut one single edge, it doesn't actually separate your tensor network into two bipartite systems. So it's not exactly, it's, it's much harder to actually find what the optimal truncation will be here. So another way to think of it, if you have a kind of correlations between two sides in your PEPS, there's actually many, many different paths ac uh, across which these correlations can kind of be mediated. So just uh, as, as without going into too much detail, the, the method that we end up using in our numerics to kind of deal with the truncation uh, in the 3D case is we use something called the simple update method in the tensor network literature. The idea is essentially that for every kind of site in our PEPs, we keep a rank one uh, approximation of the environment living on the bonds connected to that site. Uh, and this rank one approximation of the environment allows us to have a truncation which is at least a bit more uh, motivated, a bit more well behaved. So just to give you some numerics, we tried uh, this tensor network decoder on the 3D surface code for bit flip, phase flip, and depolarizing noise. You might notice bit flip and phase flip here are different. The reason is for the 3D surface code, there's no kind of symmetry when you exchange X and Z. So the bit flip case is when you have kind of weight six stabilizer, so the, the point sector, and we compare the tensor network decoder with matching. Uh, 
Uh, and matching realizes the minimum weight uh, decoder here, so the optimal decoder without the degeneracy, so to say. And you see that we can significantly outperform matching. We don't actually get the optimal threshold. That would be around 3.3%, but we're like somewhere in the middle between matching and the optimal threshold. For the phase flip noise and the depolarizing noise, we, all, we compare with the state-of-the-art decoders, which I believe in both cases are BPOSD. And in both cases, we, we, we outperform the, the, the state of the art. You might notice in, in the phase flip noise, it's also known that the optimal threshold is around 23%, and our crossing seems to be a bit more in line with that. OK, so time is going forward quickly. So let me say something about uh, decoding two decodes with circuit level noise. So as I mentioned earlier, right, we have to repeat the syndrome measurement circuit many, many times, and we want to kind of keep track of all possible faults that can happen during those syndrome extraction circuits and also how the circuit kind of spreads faults around. So in this setting, just mathematically defining the optimal decoder is already quite a, a tricky task. Um, so in order to do that, we use the formalism, uh, the detector error model formalism, or some people also call it the decoding hypergraph formalism. And essentially, the, the, the point here is that this allows us to kind of reduce the decoding problem or express it as a decoding problem of a classical linear code, which then again allows us to apply the tensor network formalism. So if you just do this for a simple five by five rotated surface code with five rounds of repetitions, we get a Lovecraftian horror looking like thing like this. Um, so it might look like there's no structure in here. There's actually structure, it's just, just so many nodes that you don't see it. And the reason is like we have to, take into account every possible location in space-time of our circuit where a fault can happen. And for every such possible fault, we look at the combination of, of syndromes that get triggered by that fault. And for every such combination, you have to add a tensor to that tensor network. So if you try to contract this with the sort of method I showed previously, this is just like flat out completely going to fail. So we need some additional tricks to make this work. So what we ended up doing is we kind of pre-compress that very complicated tensor network into a much simpler form, into a cubic lattice, where every side of that cubic lattice kind of corresponds to a syndrome measurement in, in, in kind of space time. And uh, the idea here is uh, that we, we take kind of all the nodes which do not lie on that cubic uh, lattice, we kind of snake it along the cubic lattice and then include those snake tensors into the uh, la la lattice tensors. And if you do this, this will like increase the bond dimension of, of, this, of this tensor network here on the right like immensely. So in order to deal with that, we again have to truncate the bonds where we again use this simple update methods. And the point here is that every side on the cubic um, tensor network has an open leg for the measurement outcome of the syndrome, which means that you only need to do this pre-contraction once offline, and then you can reuse it for every sample that you decode afterwards. And with this trick uh, under our belt, we managed to make the tensor network decoder also work for circuit level noise. We couldn't go beyond distance seven just because the tensor network is insane. Uh, but uh, we still managed to beat matching at least uh, quite convincingly in, in, in that regime. Um, okay, so let me get to the, to the outlook. Uh, so we, we managed to make the 3D tensor network decoder work, um, but it's, it's not perfect, so as you've seen, uh, we still don't, we don't reach the optimal threshold everywhere, right? So there's some accuracy issues. Also, if you go like beyond, starting like from distance 13-ish, you really start running into like speed and, and, and stability issues. And uh, it should be said that the kind of approximate contraction scheme that we use, it's, kind, it's one of the simplest actually. There's probably smarter things out there you could do. And uh, we're, we're trying to, to well, look with more, with, well, we, we, we think that with, with more advanced methods, probably the speed and the accuracy can be significantly, significantly improved. So to a certain degree, I would say that this result could be, should be taken as a proof of principle. And hopefully in the future, this sort of like 3D tense network decoders will allow us to, well, first of all, probe the importance of degeneracy in 3D. So especially for circuit level noise, as far as I understand, the importance of degeneracy is not uh, very well understood. And also, uh, obviously, we, we want to just have a very accurate decoders, so uh, experimentalists can use that for their quantum memory experiments. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to answer your questions. Okay, we have time for some questions. Remember, please come up to the microphone if you have questions. Um, can these uh, tensor network decoding methods also be fruitfully applied to some class of 
classical LDPC codes? Um, so because the tensor network follows the locality of, of the code, right, you'll, you'll have some tensor network with a, well, LDPC-like kind of structure. And um, I don't want to say it's not possible. I think this is something that's not really been studied before, but we don't know how to do it. OK, thanks. It's, I mean, maybe I should say, like, the approximate tensor network contraction scheme are mostly, like, studied in like the condensed matter literature where people usually study 2D or 3D kind of systems and they don't really study these problems of like contracting uh, tensor networks with these sorts of topologies, yeah. Hey, thanks for the talk, um, very nice. So um, you, you mentioned how these tensor network methods, since they're very expensive, it's usually like you usually think of using this for offline decoding. Do you think there's hope of, sh can one reasonably hope for like one day having specialized hardware that does the sensor network contractions for like online decoding, or should I really think of this as like an offline trick kind of forever? Um, this is something that's not really been uh, studied too well before. I think people, when, when people look at tensor network methods, they typically focus on the, like getting the best possible accuracy you can get. Mm -hmm. But this kind of, area where you lower the bond dimension uh, and, and, and get into like comparable speeds with, I don't know, matching or something, like how, how well the tensor network decoder performs there, that's not something that's very well studied. So uh, this is something we definitely want to look at in the future. Also, it should be said that the, in terms of asymptotic scaling, the tensor network decoder is actually not that bad, right? It scales linearly with the, with the number of tensors in your tensor network, so linearly in the code size, which is quite favorable, right? So, okay, there's a caveat to that. It's, it gets linearly in the code size and, and uh, cubically in the bond dimension. The question is how large does the bond dimension need to be with respect to the code size? And this is something that's not un well understood. Thank you. Have you, in your circuit level simulation, do you simulate the memory time? Uh, they may be raised to error between um, error correction cycle to next cycle? Um, no, we just we just uh, add a t depolarizing channel. Uh, uh, I think is it after? No, before every gate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Do you know um, what the error is that you make by using this approximate contraction? Um, you you mean whether you can bound that error or? Um, so you, you can, you can. So you say this is the most obvious, uh, most naive uh, way of doing this approximation. There may be better methods. Like, uh, do you have an idea of how bad or how good this approximation is that you use? Well, I mean, as in with all numerics, Typically, what you just do, you just increase your bond dimension up to a point where it converges, and then you, 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 you assume that it's like good enough. You don't in in practice, you never actually prove that your error is smaller than a certain thing. I think you could do that in practice. Uh, you you could actually do that. You can you could actually try to prove yes, my approximation error is smaller than than this by just like doing like triangle inequality and looking at like what is the error at every step in the contraction. But typically, I think the numerics perform way better than these kind of triangle inequality bound. So in practice, you never do that. More questions? Um, I have a question. You mentioned this detector error model uh, picture, which is like dual to the generator or StatMech picture, performs numerically better in practice. Do you understand why that's the case? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, in line with the previous question, I mean, uh, there are other ways to contract 3D tensor networks. For example, there's like uh, uh, tensor network renormalization methods where you, you know, you sort of take a ball and you shrink it to a smaller ball and you do this everywhere and then you sort of repeat. Have you thought about trying one of these contraction methods? Um, we tried our G contraction a little bit. We, we tried a, a lot of different things. Um, I don't want to say like this, it's definitely better than RG contraction. In the few tests that we did, it performed better, uh, but maybe there's ways to make the RG contraction work better. I mean, there, there's so many tricks you can do. I mean, like just just like gauging the the kind of peps you can do, like belief propagation gauging. There's like so many things you can do. We we tried like <laughs> for a few months, like a lot of different things what worked best, and this is what we ended up finding at the end. But like I'm, I'm convinced if like someone with like 
more tensor network experience would have a crack at this, it would probably like improve it significantly. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, let's thank Christoph again for a nice talk.